All right. And with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Tonight we have Heidi Hatcher with us, and she is uh, joining us from Glen Allen right now in her office. Thanks for joining us, Heidi. Um, she has a Bachelor's of Science in Ecology and Environmental Science and a BA in Spanish, which is quite interesting. I just learned that tonight from the Appalachian State University, University in North Carolina. She has a professional background in, in environmental education and she's a backpack instructor. Um, she's instructed backpacking courses both in North Carolina and in Alaska. Heidi has been in Glen Allen since 2015 and she has spent the last two years as area biologist. She said her favorite part of her job is managing the Neltina caribou herd because of all the fun challenges that presents and all of the travel she gets to do across the, the really neat landscape. So with that, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Heidi. Thanks, Sarah. Can everybody hear me okay? You can hear me, right? <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, hi folks, I'm Heidi Hatcher, and as Sierra mentioned, I'm the Glen Allen Area Wildlife Biologist, which means I have the pleasure of managing big game and fur bearer populations in Game Management Unit 11, which is the green on this map, and Game Management Unit 13, which is purple. And in this area, we're responsible for populations of bison, moose, doll sheep, black bears, brown bears, wolves, and several other critters. But the most challenging and dynamic population that I manage is by far the Neltina caribou herd. Now, if you saw my Neltina caribou presentation in December, that was hosted by the Wrangell Institute for Science and Environment. I'll warn you that the first half of this presentation is very similar to that one. Toward the end, however, I took out the counting caribou video and I added a little bit more on typical, typical behavior of the herd during the hunting season and some hunting tips and frequently asked questions that we get about um, hunting Neltina caribou. So if you're willing to review the management info in the beginning, um, there's some more, there may be some new info for you towards the end. So um, for as long as humans and caribou have coexisted in Alaska, people have utilized caribou as a source for food, tools, and clothing. While methods of harvesting and interacting with caribou have changed over the years, the importance of this species to Alaskans remains paramount. In Inuit and astronomy, the Big Dipper is actually a caribou, which shows what an iconic species it is to Alaska since we have a caribou on our state flag. If you haven't already watched the previous episodes in this lecture series, I encourage you to do so for a great overview of caribou as a species. It's generally considered that we have 32 herds of caribou in Alaska, the vast majority being barren ground caribou. Researchers have taken a close look at the genetics of these herds. And if we're looking at, looking at a very coarse scale, the vast majority of the mainland caribou herds are somewhat related and the herds on the Alaska Peninsula are more distinct. If you look more closely though at a finer scale, you can find some genetic distinctions between herds on the mainland. As humans, we like to categorize and compartmentalize things and for all practical purposes, that makes thinking about and managing these animals much easier. So we break them down into herds based largely on location and behavior. Speaking in very general terms, caribou tend to be migratory and calving areas and summer range are fairly consistent from year to year. Wintering range, on the other hand, is more prone to variation. So herds are often named based on their traditional calving areas. If you look at number 18 on the map, that's the herd that we're gonna be focusing on this evening. So that's the Nelchina caribou herd, which on one hand is a typical barren ground caribou herd. What makes the Nelchina herd unique is that it spends spring, summer, and fall in a relatively accessible area of Alaska that I mentioned before is Game Management Unit 13. On this map, GMU 13 is highlighted with a cream color. The orange lines are roads, so you can see that Alaska's main highways run right through Unit 13, connecting the urban areas of Fairbanks and Anchorage. The herd provides subsistence and sport hunting opportunities for local communities, as well as those folks living in Anchorage, Fairbanks, and beyond. High demand and relatively good accessibility make this one of the only caribou herds in Alaska for which the size of the herd can reliably be moderated through hunter harvest, which has led this herd to become a notorious experiment in caribou management since the 1990s. This evening, I'll describe a bit of the background that led us to where we are now and explain how we currently monitor and manage the Neltina herd. Caribou populations are known for going through dynamic boom and bust cycles, and these cycles typically occur over 40 to 70 year periods. Sometimes cycles may span even longer timeframes. 
This is a population graph from the Central Arctic car caribou herd, but it shows what a typical population cycle looks like for caribou and is characterized by a long extended period of low numbers with slow growth, followed by a very dramatic increase in population size that often results in the herd overshooting the carrying capacity of the range and the herd then experiences a precipitous decline. As a caribou population cycles through size, we tend to see another predictable pattern. The larger the herd gets, the wider it ranges. As the herd declines again, so does the area that it uses in a given year. When the herd begins to grow again, it expands the use of its range, roaming further each season. This map shows the range of the 40 mile herd changing over time, which corresponds with the size of the herd. As the range expands, the herd is more likely to mix with nearby herds. Mixing typically occurs during the winter season, which is when caribou migrate away from their calving and summer grounds. As herds mix, we also start to see more herd switching when an animal that traditionally belongs to one herd may switch it up and follow another herd back to its calving ground in the spring. That animal may switch herds again the next year, or it may not rejoin its original herd for several years, if ever. Over time, like other typical caribou herds, the Nelchina herd has undergone these same fluctuations in herd size and range use. With this map, I'll run you through the history of Nelchina herd fluctuations and how we got to where we are today. There are red stars at Glen Allen and Dawson, Yukon, which correspond with the red stars on the smaller map of Alaska and Canada, to give you an idea of where we're talking about. The orange lines are roads, yellow is the border between Alaska and Canada. Census attempts for the Nelchina herd began in 1948, but they weren't conducted regularly. Prior to 1948, the history of the herd's movements was pieced together from oral histories and observations, giving us a decent idea of herd movements back to about 1860. If we compare historic range use with more recent range use and associated herd size, we can make some assumptions about relative herd size back to about 1860. So in this map, the blue represents historic range use and orange bars on the graph represent relative herd size. As we get to actual herd estimates, those bars will change to red. Keep in mind that the range maps I'm going to show you are very general. One thing that's certain with caribou is if you try to generalize them, they will inevitably find a way to define the rules that you outline. So early accounts tell us that around 1860, the Nelchina herd was pretty large and was ranging to the upper Copper River and even up the Chitna River. The herd declined after that period and by 1885, only a few caribou were wandering as far as the Copper and Chitna Rivers. By 1900, the herd was using a much smaller range annually. The herd was spending the entire year in a relatively small area, mostly within the Talkeetna Mountains. Then the herd began to grow again, but how much and how quickly is a little bit unclear. Sorry, sometimes my clicks aren't quite working. In the 1920s, local people would drive to Paxson to hunt caribou in the fall and winter. In 1925, the first caribou in many years came into the area near Chitna. So things get a little bit fuzzy around that time. And so for now, I just have a orange caribou down by Chitna to represent those observations. In 1930, caribou were also in the Katsina area. It's not clear, however, whether these caribou are from the Nelchina herd or from the Mentasta herd, which is a nearby herd that's closely related to the Nelchina herd. And these animals are known to mix in the years when their range use overlaps. Nelchina animals were first reported to winter in Lake Louise Flats in 1945, which su suggests that the caribou around Chitna and Katsina in previous years were more likely Mentasta caribou. The first count for the Nelchina herd happened in 1948, and there were roughly 10,000 caribou. As you see on the graph, red years are actual counts, whereas the orange numbers are those relative estimates that I talked about. By 1950, the range of the herd had increased to 10,000 square miles and caribou were traveling up to 370 miles annually. By 1955, the wintering grounds began to shift westward and the herd was splitting into different groups seasonally, which is what we've seen the herd do in recent years. Sorry, this is just being kind of slow sometimes. By 1960, the range had increased to 20,000 square miles and caribou were traveling up to 980 miles annually. Immigration out of the area was documented in winter and the Copper and Susitna basins were considered to be saturated with caribou. We have actual counts of the herd during that time and the size of the herd reached 71,000 adult animals in 1962. 
If you include calves in the herd count, there may well have been around 100,000 caribou using the range in the early 60s. Range assessments suggested that some of the range was negative, negatively impacted by overuse during that time. By 1967, a count documented that the herd was in decline, which was confirmed with annual counts starting in 1970. I haven't been able to dig up range maps from that time period yet, but we can assume that the herd was not ranging as far during that period. The herd began to grow again in the 80s, and by the late 80s, the herd had started heading towards Canada, the Canada border in winter. As the herd grew in the early 80s, an objective was established to keep the herd under 20,000 adult caribou. When that herd size was reached, the herd seemed healthy. So in, in 1984, the objective was raised to keep the herd under 30,000 adult caribou. In 1991, that objective changed from 30,000 overwintering adult caribou to 40,000 caribou total for the herd. Come on, slide. It's locked up on me. Here we go. I hope I didn't skip one. Okay. With the new objectives, as the herd grew above 40,000 total animals, harvest was used to bring it back down. In the early 90s, the herd was migrating into Yukon and harvest was increasing to control the herd. In 1996, the objective was changed again, this time to add a lower limit for the herd. The idea was to keep the herd large enough to provide a reliable level of harvest annually, but also keep the herd below carrying capacity and avoid the big booms in population and subsequent years of low numbers and slow growth. So the objectives became to keep the herd between 35,000 and 40,000 animals after the fall hunt. And that's what managers work to do. As the herd got larger, range expanded and more mixing and herd switching would occur. Sometimes it can be difficult to control herd growth when winters are mild and productivity is high. So the herd reached nearly 50,000 animals in 2010 and by 2013 was traveling into Yukon again. Keeping the herd within those objectives so far seems to be working, although the herd has recently been at or above objectives and is showing more variation in range use year to year. Sorry about the delay on this. <laughs> it's just being kind of slow. In 2017, animals went all the way to Dawson, Yukon. The following year, the herd wintered closer to home. And then last winter, the herd split into different groups, some leaving the unit, some wintering around Mount Drum, and some staying home. This winter, the herd split with some going up towards chicken and most of the herd wintering the lake country in 13A. So keeping the herd within that objective range of 35,000 to 40,000 animals is what makes the Neltina herd a bit of a management experiment. But how do we manage a herd that is migratory, unpredictable, and would typically have large swings in population size? First, there are some things that we need to know each year to know what the herd is doing. We need to know how big the herd is, how productive it is, how many animals we can harvest to remain in objectives. We need to know thing, these things so that we can man manipulate the one thing that we really have some amount of control over, and that is harvest. Each winter, we have to determine the number of permits that will be issued for the coming season. And each summer, before the hunting season starts, we have to establish quotas for each hunt. The goal is to allow hunters to harvest as many caribou as we can to maintain that more stable population size without over harvesting. Ideally, this means we don't drop too low, but we also don't let the herd grow too big. So in order to get the information that we need to manage that harvest, we have tools that we deploy annually to help us tackle many of these challenges. And these tools are radio collars. Deploying collars on caribou is a logistically intensive task that we undertake typically at least once a year. By the first week of October each year, we've gathered darts and mobilization drugs, prepared the dart gun, gathered safety equipment, compiled our sampling gear, scheduled an experienced helicopter pilot, procured and prepared radio collars, and are ready to deploy these collars. We sent out each October to capture 20 female calves of the year. I'm going to show you a real short video of kind of what that looks like. If the internet is fast enough that you can watch it. <laughs> um. I'm going to 
the mat. All right, so from the helicopter, we dart a female cap with immobilization drugs and then back off and wait for the drug to take effect. When the drug does take effect, the animal sits down as an, and is under the influence of a pretty strong op opioid, so it doesn't really care what's going on around it. We bundle it up in a net and use a weigh pole and a crane scale to get a weight on the animal. We then fit, the collar, fit a collar on the animal and collect some measurements such as mandible or jaw length. We might also collect a hair sample for genetic analysis and a blood sample to archive for future re research. You'll notice that the photo of fitting the collar is not a calf of the year. Just for fun, Sierra, um, if you want to drop the poll, Sierra is going to give you guys a poll right now for you to weigh in on whether you think that adult caribou is a bull or a cow. <clears throat> in addition to the VHF collars that we deploy annually, we try to maintain a poll like collars in the herd on adult bulls and cows. So let's see what you guys think. Heidi, can you see the results? Yeah, I can. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think everybody's pretty much voted by now. Um, do you wanna, sh I don't know, can people see them or do you have to share them? I'll share them right now. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so we had 72% of folks were correct. That is a cow caribou. Um, and it, it does have fairly large antlers for a cow, but um, that can happen. And um, that's one of the cool things about caribou is both bulls and cows have antlers if you didn't watch some of the previous episodes. <laughs> um, so let's see if I can get this to start working again. So VHF, VHF collars emit a radio signal that must be tracked with a receiver and antenna, whether you're in an airplane tracking them or on the ground. Satellite collars emit a VHF signal that we can track, but they also communicate with satellites, sending us regular updates on where the collar is so we can keep track of these collars from the office. Of course, we're not allowed to share recent telemetry data, so this map is outdated, but it gives you an idea of the data that we're getting from these satellite GPS collars. Now, VHF collars, as you can imagine, are much less expensive than satellite GPS collars. So that's why we deploy GPS collars on adults, which are already recruited into the population, and they're less likely to die within the coming year. Because they're expensive, we try to maintain 40 to 60 GPS collars in the herd, which means we only have to deploy more GPS collars every few years. Every year, however, we deploy 20 VHF collars on female calves of the year. Calves are much less likely than adults to survive through the winter. So by deploying 20 VHF collars just before winter, we can track those collars through the winter months and on into the spring to determine winter mortality and get an idea of how many calves were recruited into the population by surviving their first year of life. We track adult collars through the winter as well, as you can see here, to get an idea of winter mortality for the adult portion of the herd as well. I mentioned that when we capture calves, we weigh them and we gather some measurements. These data give us an important glimpse into the health of the herd that year. Female calves during the first week of October can weigh anywhere from 75 pounds to 150 pounds, but we like to see the average weight of the 20 calves that we capture to be around 118 pounds or more. If the average weight is below 115 pounds, then that's a sign that we may have too many animals on the landscape, as the calves didn't have enough nutritional availability, either from the mother, the landscape, or both, to grow as much as we'd like to see before winter. We measure mandible length and metatarsal length for the calves as well, which gives us a similar glimpse into growth of the animals. We call these morphometric measurements, and when we see averages start to drop from year to year, or if we see a sudden drop, then we know we should work towards reducing the overall size of the herd. The other important role of the VH VHF collars is that if a calf survives that first winter and is recruited into the population, we can then track her every year in the spring to determine how old she is when she has her first calf and whether she has a calf each year after that. When we combine this information for all the collars that are active in the herd, then we have some really valuable information that helps us understand the movements and productivity of the herd. So we've gathered winter mortality for both calves and adults, and then in the spring we do partrition survey to see how many of our collared caribou are pregnant or have a calf. That tells us how productive the herd is that year, which is another indicator of herd health. 
as cows generally have one calf every year, but they might skip years if they're nutritionally stressed. Productivity of the herd is also vital for us to understand the trajectory of the herd, which helps us determine what the harvestable surplus will be from year to year. I mentioned that we track when a cow has her first calf. One important indicator of herd health is the partrition rate of three-year-old cows. If a herd is very healthy and has plenty of nutrition available on its range, cow caribou will typically have their first calves at three years old. If the three-year-old partrition rate drops, that can be a sign that the herd is nutritionally stressed as cows are not having their first calves until they're four years old. The rule of thumb is that if the five-year weighted average of three-year-old partrition drops below 55%, we need to look seriously at reducing the size of the herd. Now, the other important part about these collars is that they inform herd distribution throughout the year. This lets us know where to find the herd to conduct surveys, how the herd has dispersed during the hunting season, when the animals start to migrate, and where they spend their winter. These collars are vital to addressing that challenge of managing a species that is migratory and unpredictable. The other major challenge is knowing how large the herd is. In late June and early July, we're tracking herd distribution regularly, waiting for the caribou to group up in what we call post-calving aggregations. If they do group up, this is the one time of the year that we have a chance to count the herd as the herd consolidates into just a portion of its range, and that generally happens to be out in the open terrain. When the caribou aggregate, we have a team of four to five super cubs that split the area between them, and each cub flies their area intensively to search out and find all of the caribou that they can. Each plane has an observer and any group that is found is counted or photographed to count later in the office. If we're lucky, the caribou will form groups that are too big for us to count or photograph in the super cubs and we'll be able to call in a photo plane. Fish and Game recently produced a 10 minute video about caribou photosynthesis efforts. And earlier in this lecture series, there was an episode about these efforts with Nate Pamphrin and Tom Seaton. So if you haven't checked those resources out yet, I encourage you to watch those videos on the Fish and Game YouTube, YouTube, YouTube channel. <laughs> But in the interest of time, I'm gonna assume that most people tuning in tonight have probably already seen the Counting Caribou video. So I took that out. <laughs> so right after we conduct a summer count, we also conduct a composition survey. For the composition survey, we have a super spotter plane leading us to caribou and making sure we don't double count groups. And we have a team in a helicopter to fly low over the, over the animals so that a biologist in the front of the helicopter can call out the sex of each animal as we go over them. This isn't exactly a video of a comp survey, but it gives you an idea of what it looks like as we fly over the caribou and conduct this comp. So I'm gonna show you another real short clip. Right. So while we're flying over the herd like that, uh, you can tell the sex of the animal as you fly over the back of it, essentially. A data collector in the back seat keeps tally of what's called out by the person in the front seat. Um, and so in the summer survey, animals are characterized as cow, calf, or bull. The goal is to categorize at least 10% of the population. So that might be 3,000 to 5,000 animals. This data tells us the proportion of cows, calves, and bulls that make up the population. Combined with a total count, we know about how many adults there are in the landscape, the ratio of bulls to cows, and how many adults we have available to harvest that season. We conduct a second composition ratio in the fall at the time that we do our caribou captures, and this time we categorize cows and calves, and we call bulls either small, medium, or large based on the size of their antlers. We compare the fall calf to cow ratio to the summer ratio to have an idea of calf survival through the summer, we take the number of cows we had in the summer, subtract harvest from the fall hunt to determine the rough number of cows still on the landscape. And then we use fall bull to cow ratio and calf to cow ratios to determine how many bulls and calves there are in relation to the to total number of cows. So combined, this gives us our estimate for fall herd size. In this example, it's 37,515, which is within the objectives of 35,000 to 40,000 for the post hunt fall herd size. So we have to issue permits in the winter, but count and composition give us the data we need to know how many caribou we can actually harvest in the fall hunt. 
The goal, as I mentioned, is to have 35,000 to 40,000 caribou in the herd after the fall hunt. We also have goals to maintain 40 calves per 100 cows and 40 bulls per 100 cows, which is why in some years we may encourage cow harvest to keep the composition ratio of bulls to cows in balance. So the board of game determines how caribou harvest should be allocated among user groups. That means that the board decides what hunt should be offered for Nelchina caribou harvest opportunity. And this table describes that the board, what the board currently has in place. Hunters must apply for one of these permits in November or December of the year prior to the hunt. And if they receive a permit, they'll have the opportunity to hunt the fall season dates listed here. The board has created a youth lottery hunt for residents of Alaska, three different subsistence hunts for residents of Alaska, which are guaranteed permits, but have some restrictions associated with them. A resident sport hunt, that's a lottery, but without the restrictions associated with their subsistence permits. And a small non-resident non -resident lottery hunt for which we can only issue permits when the herd is within or above objectives. So essentially the board determines who gets permits and how, and then it's our job to manage the harvest of these hunts to prevent over harvest. We do that by using the summer herd data we collected and we establish quotas for each of these hunts. If the herd is quite large and growing, quotas might be very high and hunters might not meet the quotas, in which case the fall hunt closes as scheduled and a winter hunt will reopen for most permit holders on October 21st. If the herd is small and less harvest is available, Hunts might reach their quotas in the fall and are then closed down by emergency order. Typically, if this happens, these hunts do not reopen for a winter season. So that summarizes how we track and manage the herd annually, which brings us to the current status of the herd. This past summer, the caribou didn't aggreg aggregate enough for us to count them, but we have really great survival information from our radio callers, and we were able to model the herd to estimate the number of summer cows at about 25,000. This fall, we harvested 2,483 caribou, specifically 1,118 cows. After our fall composition survey, we estimated that we have 35,000 total caribou, which is right at the bottom of our objectives. Normally, that might mean that we would not open a winter hunt, but this year we were at the bottom of the objectives because calf survival is pretty low early in the year. This fall, we had less than 18 calves per 100 cows, which is what brought the total herd estimate down. We still had more adults than we should, and we are seeing some signs that support the idea that we should lower the size of the herd, such as three-year-old partrition dropping to 53%. So we opened the winter seasons to allow for the take of additional adult caribou. We encourage the take of cows without calves because we can't control herd growth without lowering the portion of cows in the herd, and our bull to cow ratio is less than 40 right now, so we wanted to curtail the take of excess bulls. Interestingly, the herd this winter, with some animals traveling north and east towards Northway and Chicken, and other animals overwintering in Unit 13. We're optimistic that even though calf numbers were low this fall, we'll have good winter recruitment through the winter since much of the herd is staying close to home. The winter hunts closed down in January when the overall quota was reached, which was based on the harvestable surplus available for the adult portion of the herd. Last week, we deployed some satellite collars on bulls and a few cows, and the animals we handled were in decent condition for this time of year. As always, we look forward to partrition, partrition surveys and the summer census to see how the herd fared. So I hope this helped explain a bit about Nelchina caribou herd and how we manage the herd as a subsistence resource. If you consider that a hunter might get 60 to 100 pounds of meat off a caribou, and while we're able to maintain the herd at a relatively stable size and productivity, if we average 3,000 caribou harvested annually, that's around 240,000 pounds of meat filling Alaskan freezers each year. This is an amazing resource for our state and the goal is to keep it that way for future generations to enjoy. On that note, I have a lot of Neltina caribou hunters watching, I believe. So I do want to finish up this presentation touching on some of the frequently asked questions that we get in relation to Neltina hunting. Now, <laughs> Because the Nelchina subsistence permits are essentially guaranteed permits if you're willing to agree to the permit stipulations, we get a lot of hunters who choose this permit as their first big game hunt. It's great because caribou are somewhat predictable and not quite as large as moose, so they provide a great opportunity for new or less experienced hunters. So one of the most frequent questions that we get during the hunting season is where are the caribou? First, I want to point out some resources that are available if you want to read up and learn more about the Nelchina herd. We have a lot of resources available on our Fishing Game website, and Sierra's gonna drop some of these links into the chat um, if you wanna take a look at them. Um, under the Caribou Species Profile page, if you go to the More Resources tab, you'll find any recent outreach publications that have been produced. 
When we produce one of these updates, we send it out to all the permit holders for that season. If you take a look at these, the population updates might be outdated right now, but there are still some valuable resources in these publications that remain relevant, especially the 2017 Neltina Caribou News, which has a lot of great articles about the general ecology movements and behavior of the herd, as well as a page with hunting, hunting tips. If you're interested in management details through time, Fish and Game posts our management reports on our website for all big game species. You can go to the link that Sierra is gonna put in the drop box, in the chat, um, click on caribou and read through the management reports back through 1970. There are also a lot of great resources on hunting forums and so forth. So you can learn a lot about the herd and how to hunt them with some online digging. That said, I'll give you a quick and dirty overview of what you're likely to expect in a quote unquote normal season. On this map, I've zoomed into the portion of unit 13 that is most relevant during hunting season. The black and white lines are roads. We have the parks on the west, the Richardson on the east, the Glen to the south, and the Denali Highway further north. The orange lines are subunit boundaries. So you have 13A in the center, 13B from Paxson to the Susitna River, 13E west of the Susitna, west of the Susitna, 13C east of the Gakona, and 13D is south of the Glen. And typically you're not gonna be looking for caribou in 13D. The other areas I wanna point out are red and yellow areas. The yellow are controlled use areas where motorized hunting is restricted during summer all of the year. To the north is the Clearwater Creek controlled use area, which is non-motorized for big game hunting with a limited exception for bears and wolves part of the year. Adjacent to that, we have a little bit of the Delta controlled use area. South of Paxson, you have the sourdough controlled use area, which is non-motorized except on designated trails. And in 13B, you have the Tonsina controlled use area, but again, you're not really gonna be looking for caribou down there. Um, then you have the Paxson closed area up by Paxson and the Sheep Mountain closed area, which that one specifically is closed to sheep and goat hunting. So not specific to caribou, but also not where I'm gonna be going to look for caribou if I'm hunting. Now, this is by no means a complete map of the trails of Unit 13. In fact, I know there are a lot um, around the Cantwell, Cantwell area that aren't on this map yet. Um, but there, this shows you that there's an extensive trail system north of Eureka and many trails off the Denali Highway in addition to the Denali Highway itself. So this is how a lot of people access the area during the fall season. One of the things that it helps to remember is that when we talk about hunting the Nelchina caribou herd, you're not heading out to look for one big herd um, when the season opens in August or September. The closest that the, herd, that the herd ever comes to being in one place at one time is in late June or early July during the post calving aggregations. Even then, they're still not in one big group. There might be 20 over here, a group of 50 over there, a group of 4,000 in one drainage, and 30,000 in a different drainage or in a different ridge um, in 13A. Aside from that, there are also more localized animals that don't necessarily group up or migrate with the larger portion of the herd. And they, they might be found in their smaller home ranges just about any time of the year. By the time August rolls around, the larger groups of caribou have spread out again. When the season opens, folks tend to have high success north of Eureka and off the western half of the Denali Highway early on. As the season progresses, those more easily accessible animals start to move to less accessible areas. This is most likely a result of the high hunting pressure at the start of the season, but I, can, we, but I guess we can't really say that for sure. But whatever the cause, hunting success slows down a bit while the animals stay in less accessible areas. Then as the hunt progresses, they start to make seasonal movements that tend to bring them back into more accessible areas and harvest begins to pick back up. Timing varies, but usually by late August, or early September, things have started to pick back up. The caribou might mill around for a while, and they may even stay, stay in the general area through the rut, but eventually most of the herd usually migrates east out of the unit. This migration can occur anytime from August through November, and this is the reason that we always encourage hunters to hunt the fall season and not rely on the winter season. Of course, caribou will be caribou, so you never know for sure what they're going to do. This year, part of the herd did migrate out of the unit in October and early November, and the rest of the herd wintered in the lake country of 13A and provided excellent winter hunting opportunity for all those folks who had difficulty getting out or finding them in the fall. So on that note, I'm gonna finish up with some tips and tricks and touch on some common misconceptions for hunting Nelchina caribou. First, if you are looking to hunt Nelchina, be prepared for your hunt. Know if you're gonna target bulls or cows or if it's open to either sex and you plan to just take the first clean shot that you can get. Have a plan for where you wanna go. Practice and commit to only shooting a shot within your comfort range. Think about what you'll do if you encounter a group of caribou. 
because you never take a shot into a group. So have a plan on how you'll target an animal at the edge of the group or otherwise avoid unethical shots. Next, if you're expecting a road hunt, you might be disappointed. Yes, you might get lucky if you stick to the road, especially when they happen to be migrating or otherwise just moving through the area. But I regularly hear people in the fall say that they've driven up and down the Denali Highway and haven't seen a caribou. Other folks during that same time frame might camp for a little while in one spot or hike a mile or two off the Denali Highway and have success. There are people who hunt the road because it's the only option that they're physical, physically capable of, and I applaud them for getting out there and getting after it. When there are caribou near the Denali or the Richardson or even Lake Louise Road, however, we often get situations where capable hunters get a little excited by the road hunt opportunity and make some questionable decisions. If you find yourself in this situation, here are some reminders. Pull off the road in a safe location. Oh, that should have come up, there we go. <laughs> there are plenty of caribou out there and no need to block traffic. Parking in the lane of the highway is a dangerous situation, especially on the Richardson Highway. Plus, when caribou are moving through, if you see some go by, then more are likely to follow. With a little patience, if you find a safe spot to pull off and set yourself up, you're likely to see some more caribou come through. You hear about shooting galleys along the Richardson and Denali when caribou are moving through the area. Every time I've witnessed the, those situations, I've avoided the crowds and instead found somewhere nearby to pull off the road where no one else is. I got away from the road a little ways to find a good area to watch for passing caribou and shoot in a safe direction. And with a little patience, I've had success while also getting away from the crowds. After the first few times I did this, I thought maybe I was just lucky, but I've been able to, to successfully repeat that strategy too many times for it to be luck. So there's really no need to block traffic and create unsafe situations just because a group of car caribou just crossed the road. Also in these situations, as in any hunting scenario, you must be especially aware of your surroundings and the direction you're shooting. The road curves, there may be traffic coming. We all know that you can't shoot on, from, or across the road, but sometimes when someone is jumping out trying to get off a quick shot, they might get tunnel vision and not think as clearly. This is why it's better just to set yourself up somewhere that you know caribou are likely to come through and be prepared for when they do come out. That also gives you more time to make sure you're targeting an animal with a clean shot and not shooting into a group. Again, never shoot into a group of caribou. You wouldn't believe how many wasted caribou get found along the road corridor after they migrate through the area. Shooting into groups causes caribou to be injured or may kill more than just one caribou. Quick unprepared shots are more likely to injure a caribou than drop it right there, and that caribou might not be found. It's really important, no matter where or how you're hunting, to remember these things and avoid injuring a caribou that will likely die later and not be found or accidentally kill more than your bag limit by shooting into a group. Now, I'll preface this next part by saying that I'm typically a solo caribou hunter, um, but whether alone or with a partner, I've had success just about any way you can do it. I've hiked in, biked in, snowshoed, snow machine, road hunted, and ATV, so I can speak to the approach. Um, I've hunted early in the fall season, late in the fall season, and in the winter. And so the best piece of advice I can give to hunters is to slow down and let the caribou come to you. Now I'm specifically speaking about when you're in the field. I don't mean to drive slowly down the road. That's not necessarily, not necessary and not advised. The Denali Highway and the Richardson Highway are actual highways and there's no need to obstruct traffic. But if you're in the field riding on an ATV or a snow machine, when you get to an area where there are fresh tracks or where you've seen caribou, slow down, stop. Get off your vehicle, hike down the trail for a ways, hike up to a high spot and sit and glass the landscape for a while. When there are groups of caribou, you're far more likely to find them if you're quiet and sitting still or moving at a walking pace rather than a riding pace. Your time is usually better spent glossing the area or waiting in a spot where you've already seen some caribou come through than staying in motion on a vehicle and trying to cover ground, hoping to spot something while both you and the caribou are moving. It's happened to me more than once. I've been dressing out a caribou and someone comes up on an ATV and asks if I've, if I've seen more caribou in the area. I say yes and tell them that if they Sit and wait, then some more caribou will come through. After about 30 minutes, they drive off. The caribou pops out. My last big piece of advice is to try to get away from the crowds and other hunters. From my experience on the Denali Highway, the Richardson Highway, and even Lake Louise Road this winter, if you can hike a little ways away from the main trail system or the road, then you're less likely to see people and you're more likely to see caribou if they're in the area. So with that, I will, am happy to answer any questions that folks might have.